You are listening to Insights from the Conference Board. Hello, my name is John Metzler, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Off the Shelf, a series which helps senior executives address challenges and stay informed about current issues ahead of market events. The series is brought to you by the Conference Board. Today, I'll be sitting down with Jay Shree Sen, Chief Science Advocate at 3M. Jay Shri is a corporate scientist at 3M who joined 3M already in 1993 and she currently holds no less than 75 patents for a variety of innovations with several additional pending. Jay Shri was appointed 3M's first ever Chief Science Advocate in 2018 and is using her scientific knowledge, her technical expertise and the professional experience to advance science and communicate the benefits of science and the importance of diversity in STEM fields. She also, she's also a member of the Carlton Society, which is the 3M Science and Engineering Hall of Fame, and she's the first female engineer to be inducted. In 2020, she was also awarded Society of Women Engineers Highest Achievement Awards. Jay Shri is, um, is also the first ever winner of a Gold Stevie Award in the new Female Thought Leaders of the Year category in 2000, uh, 2021. Jay Shri was featured in a docuseries, she's a movie star as well, um, not the science type, and she is an author of two books, The Heart of Science, Engineering Footprints and Fingerprints and Imprints, and The Heart of Science, Engineering Fine Prints, published by Society of Women Engineers. And all sales, and this is significant, all sales proceeds go to a scholarship for underrepresented minority women in STEM. Jay Shri has two adult children and her husband is, is also a 3 mer so wow, what a what an impressive bio um, this is. And so Jay Shri, um, with this um, with this introduction, right? How did this little girl from India, um, from hot India, end up in the cold of Minneapolis and has become such an icon at such a such a phenomenal company, uh, 3M? Thank you for the kind introduction. I was uh, listening to it and I was thinking this could get embarrassing, <laughs> but you did a great job, so I appreciate that. Um, my journey, well, I uh, grew up in northern India. Uh, you know, it was actually on the campus of one of the top engineering schools. So I was surrounded by STEM professionals and uh, my dad was a professor there. So all the kids at that time had really strong encouragement from their parents to go into engineering. And it's simply because we had the premier engineering institution right in town. Um, but there was a slight problem that I never thought of myself as this... Um, you know, science and engineering type, the kind, you know, that they say they like to play with, you know, tools and tinker with stuff or uh, tear apart their toys. I was actually always more interested in, in, in human context. And I really liked humanities related subjects. And honestly, I could just relate to them more. And I loved writing. I wanted to solve problems. Um, I wanted to improve lives. I wanted to make the better world a better place. And I was drawn to fields where I thought this contextual pull was strong. And I honestly just didn't see the pro-social context of STEM careers because that was just not talked about and it wasn't visible. And really, when you're young, you need someone to connect the dots. Um, but, you know, strong parental guidance still directed me to engineering, uh, despite what I thought of was my lack of affinity for the field. And But I really had no option to listen to my parents. And in looking back, you know, I do realize how much I missed that context throughout my educational journey, actually, because the engineering education is so content heavy and it virtually provides you no context or back in the day it didn't. So then I ended up in graduate school in the U.S. Uh, and it was really in my master's program that it really hit me. Now I was on my own and I was questioning, is this what I want to be doing? Is this what I wanted to do with my life? And I had uh, what I know now is called communal goal incongruity. So it just does not add up. There is incongruity in what you're doing and what you think you want to do. So I completely did not see what I was doing relating to my pro-social goals. So I finally said, I need to do something now for myself. And so I switched my fields from my master's to my PhD. And I then ended up in a lab that was more collaborative. And I realized, oh, that's what I was missing. I had an advisor that was more supportive. And I realized, 
hmm, how important that is to people. And then a project that I could build context around. And that context really set me on fire and you couldn't get me out of the lab. There was so much I could do and I wanted to do. I just threw myself into the work and enjoyed every moment of it. And I found that I loved what I did and what I was doing was science. And it was that context that I could build around the projects that really inspired me. So I am glad I ended up as an engineer because I did fine, not just because of my STEM education, but because of what I loved and what I learned. I loved the human context, which I brought into science and what I learned through my lived experience of walking into uncharted territory, you know, without a manual. And that is exactly what that has led me to develop. You know, you talked about the 76 patents, et cetera, all the innovations in my role as a scientist and uh, my skills that those are the ones that make me successful in this additional role that you mentioned that I have, which is the uh, chief science advocate for the company. And this role was created specifically to advocate for science because uh, there is research that we do at 3M into the public perception of science. And it revealed that science is actually quite invisible. It's underappreciated. It's taken for granted. So that was really an innovative move by 3M to actually create this position. And, uh, you know, I was just recently in South Africa at World Science Forum, and I talked about the public perception of science and the importance of diversity in STEM fields and really the role of science and social justice. And then I flew from South Africa to D.C. yesterday and had the amazing opportunity to represent 3M at a White House summit on STEM equity where a national plan was unveiled. So, yeah, I'm, I'm jet lagged, but super excited to be here. <laughs> That sounds like a great story. And you know what, it's, it's partly it, uh, it, it resonates with my own story um, because I, I, I also did chemical engineering um, and I, I did a master's um, and it was fine. I, I enjoyed my the challenges that it represented, but it never really was the passion that I had. Um, so I saw all my, my, my colleagues go into uh, to the oil business and I said to myself, I don't see myself trotting around the oil business. And then I got, you know, finally at P&G um, it was about touching lives, improving life. Uh, and I, that, said, that really resonated, that, that humanity side that you just described so eloquently. Um, and uh, except I didn't end up with 76 patents uh, and I never been to the White House. But besides that, um, we have some parallels, which I guess made our earlier uh, conversation so, uh, so interesting. Um, now, so let's, let's, let's unpeel this a bit more. So science and, 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 and humanity, uh, what, what, is the, what is the connection? What's the relevance? Why is that so important? Well, I think the most important piece is identifying problems to solve and collaborating with others to solve them. That requires a very human context of what is a problem? Why is it a problem? And then collaborating with other humans, that requires a very human context as well. I mean, sometimes people don't like to peel back the curtain on what really innovation is. And innovation involves real people. And science is a great way to do it. And I'm curious. That's important. That's a very human innate quality. Uh, and I love to learn, which I think is, again, a key ingredient for innovative thinking. And I love to take ideas and turn them into commercial innovation, which requires the ability to give something sustained effort. And I like doing that as well. So I think that's what's behind it. It's about the art of science. It's, it's really the beauty of the scientific method, if you think about it. You know, the mystery, the drama, the intrigue it holds. And uh, I live for those challenges and the satisfaction of finding relevant problems to solve and to create solution that will help our customers. And I often say for me, it's like investigative journalism, right? First you have to uncover information, then, then, then comes the detective work. You know, be curious, ask a lot of questions, track down leads, observe the clues, and then put all those pieces together. And that's like an artist. And, and you see the mosaic that you have just built and then develop a compelling narrative out of that. And you have to be a storyteller. And you have to convince yourself with the story and then others that this is a problem worth solving. And then you have to present the case like a lawyer and inspire others to join the cause like a leader. And then as craftsmen, you know, working as a team on specific tasks, you have to use the right tools. You have to identify the building blocks. And that's how you take ideas and invent and innovate. And you paint the vision of where to go next. So really, the scientific method has it all. Nothing there about it not to love, especially if it can lead to innovation. So bringing that human context is, is, is critical. Um, 
I can tell you uh, the humanities mindset is critical for innovation now more than ever before, as you mentioned. I would say to STEM students, whatever you are studying, make sure you complement your education with liberal arts, you know, sociology, psychology, the social sciences, humanities, because honestly, this knowledge will give you the power tools that you need where, you know, STEM may solve the problem. Humanities will allow you to probe what the right questions to ask are. Science aims to analyze. Humanities can help you synthesize. Humanities can help you meaningfully engage, uh, you know, critically think, uh, empathetically listen, and effectively communicate. And all these things are so important if you're trying to innovate. And so um, I think it's very important. So much wisdom in five minutes. It's incredible. Um, and that, I mean, I'm sure this is what science should be all about, right? Um, but that's unfortunately not the way that, that many of us see science. Um, and so... The way you explain it is uh, is very powerful. Science is about you know getting that customer obsession, that 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 interest, that curiosity, um, and that ultimately you know you take that science and you 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 work with the team to take the science and turn it into innovation. Um, it's all those dimensions that are making this so, such a fascinating field. or should be making it. Um, uh, and so um, I, I say that um, to many leaders as well. But I'm glad that you bring it to students. Um, you know, when I talk to leaders, how many how many humanity courses did you have in your engineering degree? And usually the answer is one or zero. Um, and that needs to change. Um, it is so absolutely critical. So I'm so glad that you bring up those points. Um, why why is why is what you're talking about now even more important? You know, since we've gone through the difficult years uh, recently versus uh, in previous times. Well, yeah, take? we. It's so critical, like you said, and the human context of science is so important because it played out during the pandemic. I mean, this is what has really, if you talk about unpeeling, that's what happened during the pandemic. Here we were, you know, virtually all of humanity. We all faced the same existential crisis. We confronted the same fears and, and most of us awaited the gift of science and the vaccine. But it became clear that if we lack the human context, Science will be rejected. Technology will not be trusted. Products will be obsoleted. Today, science enjoys an improved public perception of science because science was center stage and scientists were center stage and they gave science a very human context during the pandemic. Times have changed. You have to bring people along. It's no longer just about the practice of science, but who are the practitioners? It's no longer the policies, but also the politics. And it's no longer about the people, but also their perceptions. And that human context is, is important because it can lead to action or inaction, as we saw. So, uh, like I say, I can give you my spiel. I like to say the real shtick is STEM. Science, humanities, technology, engineering, and math. So I am disappointed to hear that many leaders, but I'm not surprised, I guess, that they haven't taken humanities course. The human context has become very critical with the pandemic experience. And, and there is, I really think it has put the spotlight on it. And because as humans, there was a cloud hanging above us. It made us anxious. We were worried, justifiably so. We were all worried for our jobs, for our families, for our health, and even our lives. And it was a time of change, so much change, very fast. And so there was a change in the very nature of change. And that's why we all struggle to make sense of it. And it's not just the crisis, but the rapid transformation that accompanies a crisis and the recognition that, oh my gosh, all our systems are, they're built for gradual, continuous improvement. And that this change in the nature of change required a very different stance at an individual and a leadership level, but there was no playbook. And I like to say that in many ways, we were back to workbooks. All of us became students constantly learning new stuff and new information, new ways of working and living. And that put into focus the heightening of what I call the VUCA world. And my flavor of VUCA is slightly different because I put the spotlight on what happened during the pandemic. And if you think about that, the pandemic really made the VUCA world of yesterday look tame and manageable. Uh, VUCA, as I'm sure your listeners know, is a term borrowed from the military, but it is often used to describe the, uh, the business world as well. You know, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous VUCA, VUCA. But now the discussion of vulnerability during the pandemic really completely eclipsed any discussion of volatility. Vulnerability, not just of our health, 
but of our communities, of our companies, of our countries was exposed. And uh, it was truly unprecedented, no question there. Uh, complex gave way to contentious. All subjects were deemed controversial, and instead of being discussed, they were being disputed. And then every action, the words and the abundant rhetoric get amplified, and that leads to additional challenges. So in my view, it was a new level of VUCA world out there. It was vulnerability, it was unprecedented, it was contentious, and it was amplified. And that really magnified our human tendencies. And that is why it is now shaping the future of work. We are beginning to question not only how we work or where we work from, but also why we work and who we want to work for. So the pandemic has really brought this human context in the forefront in a very profound way. And we have all had these great realization at a very human level, and we are all doing this reevaluation and reassessment of our relationship at work and this search for meaning, search for meaning and search for an, a different mindset and in an altered mood on our work altogether. And it is going to impress upon the nature of work for years to come. So it's very important for leaders and managers to understand that there is no going back to the way things were because toothpaste is out of the tube, as they say. We can't go back. So as leaders and as uh, visionaries or innovators, we have to figure out how to adapt. And that's who will drive innovation because we may never go back to having a on-site workforce completely or uh, you know, build an organizational culture that only counts on people who are sitting there, but we still have the innate need for connection and belonging. So, you know, tools and systems and procedures have their place, but employee engagement will warrant engagement at a personal level, at a human level again. So all those things have changed. You know, we don't run into each other as we used to. How do you still create that 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 need that we all have? So what I say is human capital strategy should really put human at the center. And as you know, John, I love acronyms. So uh, here's one uh, for you right away after my new version of VUCA. Human is holistic. So that needs to take into account the very human context of well-being for human beings. So holistic view. U is for a unified strategy. So what that I mean by that is unsiloed because you can't just have HR developing something. You can't just have your IT folks developing something. You really need unified strategies for the way we're gonna work on silo. M is for meaningful measures. And I say meaningful measures before I say metrics, because you can't develop metrics till you understand what is a meaningful way to measure this new way we are gonna work. Then we have to have analytical approaches, but with very good governance, because we can monitor a lot of things that our employees are doing, but we've got to have good governance in place. And then finally, N is for nimble. Nimble for whatever is the new or evolving next normal. So the bar is really high, and whoever makes uh, you know uh, effort right now to rethink and reconfigure the way we work and, and the interconnected professional, personal, and social context in which work gets done, those who put the work into it now, they are the ones who are going to rest easy and likely reap great rewards. So that's the reason why in this tremendous time of change, we have to uh, bring in the human context. Human central, this is excellent. And so, uh, you know, you said uh, already that you love acronyms. I love your acronyms, your mnemonics, I guess you call them sometimes as well. Uh, I found them very, very powerful. Uh, the first one is STEM, right? S-H-T-E-M. Oh, that's right. Please, in yes. please include the H in there. Um, never forget that anymore. Uh, you mentioned your VUCA. Uh, interesting because you take, I, when I started to teach, I, I, I triggered the audience with, you know, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But of course, that was eight years ago, and now we're living in a much different world. I call it VUCA on steroids. <laughs> you, call, you, you take a slightly different dimension to go and, uh, and explain that we are in yet new times uh, and more challenging times. Um, and, the, and then you also introduce your human one, um, uh, you know, um, so uh, wonderful um, reminders, actually, of to go and, and, uh, and, and understand um, the, the new realities of today's world. Now, you talked a lot about the why, um, you know, so the, the world we're living in and how and, and, and why, so why it's so important that humans are in the center. Now, with that constant change, right, I mean, we'll call it, we, you know, we, we, have, we have titled this Innovating Innovation, um, you know, as a theme. How do you innovate in today's world? How do you constantly innovate how you innovate? Um, and, and so I know you have another acronym for that as well, right? Um, 
Yes, of course, I always do. You know, it's just, the reason why I use these mnemonics or acronyms or acrostic style is I think it just allows people to remember it very quickly and also makes it very real in a metaphorical sense. And so it's it's just a jog of memory to, to and it keeps me excited. Um, you know, and innovation really requires a change in strategy at a time of this great change. And I see a lot of people just feeling paralyzed with all the change around them. And I say, here's a way to just focus your energy in three areas, simply just three areas in which I am confident that we can all take action. So let me explain what they are. First is the opportunity to continue to anticipate the next normal. And this is made easy because we saw during the pandemic accelerations of trends. And we have clearly seen that we can think about, oh, because that happened, what can happen next? So you can develop actionable insights to execute rapidly. So what may have seemed strategic decisions for the future, they got accelerated and many require immediate action to stay relevant. So what did we see? We saw the acceleration of digital. We saw the acceleration of banking. We saw the acceleration of telehealth. We saw the sudden acceleration of education and remote mode. We saw acceleration of retail. So much has changed. What does that mean for the path we are on? What are some actionable insights that you can allow to, to rapidly adopt and adapt to whatever is the new normal? So I'm not talking about business as usual, death by committee, death by Excel. This is something you can fast track to play strategic bets and learn. So think about it from what is going on in the world, things that have gotten accelerated, what is the next normal, and what actionable insights can I get from that? So I will give you an example. I told you about the survey that we do every year called State of Science Index, and we try to understand the global perception of science. We had already done our survey for the year, and then the pandemic hit. And it was like, oh my gosh, everything that we have generated may not make any sense, but we've already done the survey but we really championed the idea of doing a pandemic pulse because imagine that trying to understand the public perception of science during a pandemic how remarkable would that be and we were able to fortunately sell that concept to our management and get that done and that's really coming from look where things are going things are changing we got to do this now no death by committee no but you've already done your survey that those results will mean nothing so that's a very specific example of something we did second the change around us calls for some honest soul searching because the pandemic we already talked about revealed vulnerabilities it also revealed strengths and shortcomings and these all put together can lead to strategic foresight by challenging old truths so now make a list of all the old truths that you believed in that were thrown out of the window when the pandemic came, because we can't miss the opportunity to examine if we're adapting. What are we learning? How are we adjusting our future plan? So think about all of that. Get your teams together and write down all the strengths that were revealed, all the shortcoming this pandemic revealed to us, and what old truths can we challenge? Because you may not be challenging them. Somebody somewhere is. And so take your projects, your platforms, your products, your education, your jobs for that matter, and challenge the old truths. And I'm certain you will see opportunities will emerge and that strategic foresight can help guide you because you don't want to lose the learnings. I'll give you another example. What we found is from our survey that people said, we really need diversity in STEM fields. I mean, we see the result why people are not trusting science. They don't see people like themselves reflected in the science community. We have to do this. We have to encourage more girls and women. So what did we do at 3M? You know us for our post-it notes and our scotch tape and maybe our N95 respirators. We actually made a docu-series. We actually made a docu-series. And why a docu-series? Because people were at home. They were watching documentaries. And it's a great way to shape public perception. And we created this docu-series called Not the Science Type, which talks about, you know, diverse women who have done great things in, in STEM fields. So this was an example of challenging old truths. Well, we don't make movies. Well, yeah, we don't. But this is a great opportunity. And finally is this brief window of time. There is a window of time right now, and it behooves us to change things within our own operational oversight. Because you can always say, well, 
they didn't do this, they're not doing that, they should do this. No, no, no. I'm talking about what can you and I do within what is our own operational oversight and does not work well for us in these kinds of times. You have to streamline, you have to simplify processes, and you have to focus on things that add value. Because a time of immense change gives this small window of opportunity where organizations can examine and re-examine structures and processes you know, before this window closes. So a time of change is actually a really good time to do that. How can we simplify? How can we make our abilities to truly innovate really streamlined so we can take out things that are hindering our progress? And again, this is not about others. It's about our own responsibility. What can we do? So what I like to say is um, the time is now. New normal, old truths, window of opportunity. And I'll tell you what I did with my window of opportunity. I said, how else can I impact what I can bring to the world? And that's where I decided to write the books. And as John mentioned, all proceeds go uh, for uh, a scholarship for underrepresented minority women in STEM. This is something I could do. It was in my own. So I'm giving you an individual example. I can give you a professional example of what we did at 3M. We developed a series called Science at Home. Suddenly, kids are learning at home. And my gosh, imagine learning science at home. You know, need to do some hands-on stuff. So we just created some DIY videos. Can you imagine? Not polished, nothing, just all of us creating videos as scientists at our home and working with baking soda and vinegar to blow up balloons. But that's what the opportunity demanded during that particular time. So action now is actionable insights, strategic foresight, operational oversight with new normal, old truths, and window of opportunity. And, so, and, and one more thing I would like to say, John, many sure. people are probably thinking, oh, my gosh, there's still people in my organization that have a tough time believing that things have changed because they may not have changed from their point of privilege. They might be missing out what is playing out in front of them. They're trying to convince you of the same two. Things will go back, you know, and there are yet others who think it's the best if things do go back to what they were because they missed the opportunity completely and the threats that you see. And there are yet others who recognize the change, but they are scared of the challenges it brings and particularly their place in whatever is this new order. And we have to open our eyes and we have to open their eyes. And this will only happen if we share our individual voice and shape our collective voice. And I have to assure you that although I'm asking you to do all this, I have never seen the willingness I see now for people to be really listening. And that's why it's important that we have to be talking because this isn't business as usual time in our journey and we really need to make it meaningful. Innovation is the need of the hour. Inspiration is the lifeblood for innovation and purpose is the lifeline right now. And I should mention it may seem daunting, but you know what I've learned, it's mind over matter. And remember, words matter, perception matter, actions matter. And it's important right now because if you're in the business of leadership, you have changed as a leader. The ship has changed and those you lead have changed. And if you're in the business of innovation, the lens has changed. And in some cases, it's a magnifying lens. In other cases, it's a camera lens. And in yet others, it's a prism. So regardless, it has changed. So we all need to become students and scratch out a lot of what we have known and get in tune with the new. And of course, you're talking here about innovation, but fundamentally, you're stepping beyond that and giving a bunch of life lessons to the audience as well. So thank you for that. Um, I always tell folks, get off the autopilot. Um, stop being busy being busy um, and, uh, and reflect on life. And what can you do? <clears throat> what is your personal leadership? How can you make, what is your contribution to make a better world? <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and uh, yeah, what is your contribution to a better world? Um, show courage to go and do that. Get out, get out of your comfort zone. Seek those challenges that you referred to earlier on as well. Um, by the way, one short question. Can you repeat the human acronym? That went real fast is, the audience, is what the audience says. Yeah, human is for holistic um unified meaningful um uh, what was the a analytics and nimble Excellent. so holistic well-being <clears throat> um and then you have to have unified unsiloed strategies you have to have meaningful metrics and measures uh you have to have analytics with the right good governance and you need to be nimble for the next normal great we got ourselves grounded <clears throat> in the reality of today, what we all need to do as leaders. Um, but we're going to talk leadership later on as well, the specifics of it. 
Um, but right now, let's focus a bit more on the process of innovation. You know, we know that innovation is much more than science, right? Science is what starts. In the end, you want to go and take science and create value um, out of the science, value for your consumers, value for your company, value for stakeholders, value for society. Um, and so, how how do you how do you do that? Um, and how do you look at this holistically? And again, <laughs> you'll have a, you have a great mnemonic to uh, introduce that. Yeah. So I. Uh... In the, in the business of solving problems for my customers, right? So for me, it's like I said, it's investigative journalism. You find out information. You ask a lot of questions. What are the needs? How do you understand the needs? There's obviously asking the customers, but there's a lot more than that because they might not know what they need. And there's so many studies out there which clearly show that. So what are the trends? What will become their needs? Who are the key players in this area? What are the competitive products? How are our current products doing? What are they not satisfying? What technologies are at play? How is the technology world progressing? Who is innovating? What is the next generation leap that we can take? What do we already know? You know, um, I take inspiration from Rita McGrath's work and created a mnemonic for that, you know, because she talked about tectonic triggers. And I basically looked at that and I said, hey, you have to look at trends. T is for technological advances. So you got to be aware of what is going on in the marketplace that relates to any technology that your customers are using, can use, will be using, should use, must use, or might use, right? So T is for technological advances. There should be somebody, you or somebody in your organization, somebody in your company keeping an eye out on the technology. Second is keeping an eye out on the regulatory or institutional changes. Oh my gosh, now that's become quite a big deal in many industries with all the regulations that are going on and all the changes. Who is keeping an eye on that? How about the environmental factors of how business is done, how the marketplace is set up, what the channels are doing, etc. The natural events that occur, there are natural and some unnatural events that are occurring in, in the world as we speak, and that's very important to understand. Demographic shifts. Demographic shifts really cause massive shifts in consumer profiles and end user profiles. So you have to understand the demographic shifts and then the social attitudes. This brings in the human context. It's very important to understand what the social attitudes are and have on the pulse of, of that. And like John said, not be on autopilot and think, well, that's just going to be the attitude. Just Look at the world today now, how much we discuss social justice and all of that. Had it not been the pandemic and everything that transpired during that and the social unrise, uh, uprise, we would not have been talking about that. So it's critical to understand social attitudes. And it has really influenced our brands and what we do as a result with the ESG goals and things like that. So basically trends, technological advances, regulatory institutional changes, environmental factors, natural events, demographic shifts, and social attitudes. Then I, I identify a worthy problem to solve in the business area I'm looking at. And then you look at the technology building blocks that we have and that we need, and then we collaborate with others to develop. So I'm essentially collecting tiles of information and assembling a mosaic. And it's a mosaic, not a puzzle. Because in a puzzle, all the pieces fit exactly so. And honestly, if the pieces are all fitting perfectly, then it may not be innovation, because innovation should have a lot of unknown, right? And in a mosaic, it's more organic. You can place the tiles anywhere and it slowly evolves. And I look at it to figure out what the story it is telling me because I have to convince myself and then others. So you have to build that compelling narrative and invite others to join so we can solve it. And you have to actually take the stakeholders with you on this journey of uncovering tiles, of putting them together, of readjusting and rearranging and building a story. And once we have the stakeholders focused on the learning, they see how it enriches this journey and it moves them away from this preconceived vision of sort of a march to the end destination. And that's when they become real champions, when they understand that there is learning going on. So it's a process. It takes time and it takes skill for you to good at and for others to take note. But it works time and time again. I'm telling you, it's one of the biggest challenges sometimes, how to get stakeholders more interested in the journey and not just a fixation on that final outcome, the destination. How to make them see the possibilities, not just the product at hand. How to make them see the trends, not just the current status of a technology. How to make them see the commitment in the marketplace and not just a customer. And to make them see the passionate people, not just some process for churning innovation. 
And I think that's the journey of moving people from uh, puzzle to mosaic, moving them to, from an uh, orchestrative framework to an organic and move them from the me, me, me to the we and find that right balance of give and take. I think that curiosity, creativity, that is what inspires me to develop new concepts, newer way of thinking, operating, innovating. And you really have to take initiative to build that context, to develop the insights, the ability to inform, influence, inspire. And that's what really allows you to have impact. Uh, and I should mention here, for those of you who have read the book Range, I was uh, fortunate to be interviewed by the author David Epstein, and he c actually covers my story. It's on uh, page 206. Uh, I'm a generalist. <laughs> Good. And honestly, I landed in the perfect culture of empowerment at 3M and it worked out for me. And I, I and it talks about the work I do and the way I like to innovate, you know, to take our science and apply it to improve lives. Um, so. so can we can we talk a bit about 3M uh, a bit more? Um, we, I was in my Asian Innovation Council in Singapore last week while you were um, you know, trouncing around in uh, in South Africa, I guess. Um, and uh, we were still talking about what's the best process of innovation? How do we create a true culture of innovation? That was a big discussion item. And so, of course, you know, 3M is not iconic for nothing. Um, how do you do innovation at 3M fundamentally? I know that's gonna be, this can take half an hour in seven minutes. I will do it in my fast version, but I talk about it a lot in many forums so, and, and in my books. Uh, but I get this question often, what is our secret sauce? And really, it's no secret. It is stuff that we've already talked about. It's actually very simple and it works. And I'll tell you six things that we do in order to make sure that we can maintain our, our culture of innovation. The first thing is expectation. You have to create an expectation that everyone will be innovative. And it is important to do that. And that itself people miss. You don't expect innovation, you're not gonna get innovation, right? Then we have resources to be innovative. We have an appetite for risk. There's an opportunity to take ideas further and there are rewards associated with that. And finally, we continually socialize the concept of being innovative. So those are six things that I just talked about. First, expectation, because unless one is intrinsically highly motivated, the rest deliver better when there's a general expectation of a certain behavior. And this expectation you will see can change the way people think and operate. Now you've created the expectation, you have got to give them resources and you have to encourage them to take risk. And that's how people will feel the freedom to be more creative. So what do we do for that? We have 15% culture where employees are empowered to use time to scout anything. And that does not have to be related to their direct project. And it's just some mental freedom that you have. So that's very important. Now, if there's ample opportunity for people to collaborate and support, to champion and lead and implement ideas, then people are inspired to deliver results. And so in our culture, what do we do? We create things like Tech Forum. They constantly throw technical people together. Once you throw people together, they will come up with ideas. Because remember, there's an expectation that you're going to be innovative. There's opportunity and risk and uh, appetite for risk and resources. How do we do resources? We have internal grant programs to support ideas. And we pitch our ideas. And the decision to award the funds are made by our peers, not by management. Management has already sanctioned the funds. Peers decide which ideas get them. And then you get rewarded and recognized for successful value creation. And that constantly inspires people to innovate. And then we continue the socialization of the concept of being innovative and how important it is to 3M, how important a place it has in a company's culture, how it is linked to rewards and recognition and promotion. And all of that socialization really helps to sustain it. And it's about the stories that get communicated. It's about the narrative that lives on. And so it's not rocket science. Many companies know this. I'm just fortunate to be working at one which has a long-standing culture. It encourages employee initiative and it encourages innovation while providing enabling resources, giving an environment where creativity and cooperation flourish having a growth mindset that drives us to take ideas and inventions and products and innovations to delight our customers. So I think these are key elements to be considered for uh, you know, fostering and uh, preserving a successful culture of innovation. And if you don't have a system level approach to any one of them, that would be a mistake. You would have to have all of them. Uh, and I have to say, you know, innovation is often reduced to a buzzword, but 
inculcating and maintaining and sustaining a true culture of innovation. It takes just that. It takes innovation and it takes it at a very holistic level. You have to understand that if you want people to innovate, you will need to give people the training ground for developing the skills that it takes to innovate. And that can only come through these elements. So you have to embrace errors. And errors, as I told you, you know, expectations, risk, Re uh, resources, opportunity, reward, and socialization. And I have to say, we don't get it right all the time. Do we have uh, <laughs> people and processes and new fang fangled principles which try to mess with it? Absolutely. But do we try to course correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's so important when people feel empowered, that's when they can innovate. And of course, failure, as you said, not everything works, right? So failure is, right. a, is part of the game. And as long as you learn from the failure, you create this culture of learning that's grounded in the deep curiosity that you started off with in this conversation. Um, that's so important to feed into your errors, if you want. Um, we have a bit of a challenge because we want to touch on a few more topics, but we're running uh, a bit short on time. We have 15 minutes left. Um, I do want to go and um, you, 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 talk, you mentioned skills just now. You wanted to make a few points around what skills are, are critical to operate successfully within this 3M or any other culture, by the way. <clears throat> you want yeah, to say I think, a few uh, words around that? Yeah, you know, 2020, there was a general sense that it would, 2022 rather, there was a general sense that it will probably be a year where we will see the implication of the major shifts and you know, continued acceleration of change and the heightening of the VUCA that we talked about. But you know what? That journey continues into 2023. And again, many of us will feel the need to be fact finders and storytellers and soothsayers. And we have to do all of that at the same time. And that's what the journey in, uh, in 2023, I think, also uh, involves. And I, oftentimes I like to invoke the image of the ever given stuck in the Suez Canal as a metaphor for a stuck innovation engine. You know, and that's not what we want to do. Uh, and we want to make sure that people understand that these big ships are really big and the paths they nav navigate are arduous and the channel is really narrow. And you don't want to be stuck in that kind of a mode uh, while this time of change is going on. What you really need is a nimble fleet, not just a large ship. And so what we have to understand is that uh, we have to break free and a strategic shift that can work well is, is uh, small fleets that have to rebuild the concept, context of our innovation and the constructs around what should be the big ships. And the last thing we want to do is be, be stuck. So I say it's an opportunity to hit reset and validate that the paths need to change course. And, uh, you know, I can unpack what I think one needs to pack on these these journeys. And there are four skills that I think are are important. The first is the skill or the ability to very simply be able to communicate the crux of an idea. Quite literally, it's the pencil cell. You know, the idea of being able to take a pad and paper and summarize what is being talked about, back of envelope. And this technique really helps with the power of persuasion. But with the pandemic and everything that has happened, it's getting tough because we may not see the people that we want to take the pen and pencil to because we may not have person to person, face to face, eye to eye contact. So I say, Let's just start building that skill where we are able to sell our ideas virtually, right? And we have to have salesmanship and spokesmanship and showmanship. I know I'm using some gendered words, but I want to communicate the meaning. Then the second very related skill that is, is building of social capital. Again, it's always been very important, but now it is very, very, very important. And social science research tells us what they are in social capital. It's bonds, bridges, and linkages. Bonds with the in-group bridges with those who are outside your group and linkages are connections with hierarchy. And these are very critical when you socialize an idea and the real skill is to be able to attain the right balance. And that is important. And another attribute is to be a team player. You have to be a citizen. So you have to have citizenship, citizenship skills and you have to work with people because people will view your ideas through a lens of how they view you. So you have to be a good citizen, a good corporate citizen and help out where necessary. And finally, the toughest one is kingship. You're just a figurehead. And sometimes, and this calls for developing skills of influence and you have to work uh, through influence. So innovation is a system level endeavor. It takes a village and navigating this journey will take all of these skills, I think, in my mind. So that's what you need to pack. 
P is for pencil cell ship. A is for allyship with all the social capital you build. C is the citizenship. Companies are going through tough times. You have to be a good citizen at this point in kingship, uh, which is about influencing. And these, these four skills, I think, can give a good idea of how to navigate the journey in the years to come, especially as this year draws to a close and we pack for next year's journey. So into 2023, all of you in the audience, go out, um, connect, uh, and influence um, is a different way of, I guess, summarizing what GH3 was just um, nicely metaphoring again in her PAC uh, mnemonic. Next, I want to talk about leadership. Um, you know, you have some fascinating thoughts on leadership, and so why don't we start there? Um, and uh, you start from um, leadership is not about Excel. Leadership is more about PowerPoint. You want to explain that a bit to the audience? Yeah, well, I, I like to call it engaged, knowledgeable leadership, and each word carries weight. You have to be truly engaged. You have to listen and learn. You need to get knowledgeable enough to have contextual appreciation, you know, not just some Excel spreadsheet, you know. You have to understand the entire PowerPoint to really know what that Excel spreadsheet cell really entails. So I need, I, so I basically say you need to know the social studies, the history, the geography, and the civics of the situation. A history lets you unpack what people are packing. What is the baggage that they're carrying? Uh, what, what have they lived through and why are they gun shy about certain things? All of that contextual human understanding you're not going to get from a spreadsheet or the number on there. Civics is the clues that you can get into the politics of the situation. Everything has politics and you will understand what is right and wrong there. And geography is the lay of the land. How are the constituents interacting with the environment? And you go about it in a scientific way, you know, social studies, social sciences, humanities is the soft skills that matter. And they are the harder ones to frankly master. Excellent. Now, I want to stop with, I want, no, not stop. I want to end your leadership perspective around your, what do you call it, your microscope and telescope, and then more um, in just a few minutes, because I do want to go and make sure we keep um, um, close to 10 minutes, maybe seven, for questions. Can you, be, can you explain your, your, your microscope, periscope? Yeah, uh, that one is just metaphorical more. thinking. Again, powerful tool to visualize concepts. And I'm a firm believer in leading from your own rung of the ladder. So you don't have to become a leader just at the top. How do you practice being a leader? So metaphors for how leaders should view their role. I talk about telescope and microscope. Viewing through those, it's a great exercise to ask yourself these questions. You know, telescope are the big picture questions. Where are we going? How do we get there? Microscope questions are detailed. And, you know, how are we doing... Uh, now the detail of the work that you need to do. And there are simple questions that train your brain and suddenly you'll start asking more questions and seeking answers. Uh, but the other piece that I also think are important because if you really, really think about it, telescope and microscope that people talk about, they are in direct line of sight. And when I started on my journey, I realized that people are not talking about the periscope, which is so important because it'll let you see what is not in the direct line of sight. And at a keen view through the periscope is critical because it can call for adjustment of even the telescope and microscope view. So, and it has been a cornerstone in my career because early I saw a business blindsided by something happened in the marketplace that no one had envisioned. And even if they did, they, they didn't voice it. And I've really worked on developing that skill because this is one view that most people miss and because it's not in direct line of sight and it takes some skill. Another view that I think is very important and we all have to train and understand is, 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 is about emotions and it's about listening to the heart. So that's the stethoscope. And it's an interesting view because it isn't a view. You got to feel it, your heart and other people's heart. And finally, it's the horoscope, the good or bad luck that we will encounter because it was part of our fate. And many times, though we can do our best and hope for the best, the rest is out of our control. But it doesn't mean that we resort to inaction because it was not up to us. It means we do the right thing without being attached to the fruits of labor. And I think this is hard to accept in some of the linear thinking philosophies. Oh, I'm going to control this, and this is the linear thinking. Uh, you know, I bring dialectical thinking, and, and people may not like to acknowledge the role of luck, but it undermines the feeling of being in control. But I think it's very, very important to acknowledge the strong role privilege has pay, played and, 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 and fate has played. So you have to be uh, very uh, conscientious about the horoscope. So I think those are the good leaders really strive to use all these views, you know, telescope, microscope for sure, but also periscope, stethoscope, horoscope and be humble. And if you use all of these views, you can enjoy the kaleidoscope of, of true leadership.
Oh, that's a nice touch, the kaleidoscope. I'd not heard you say that. <laughs> Bring it all together. Um, I, I, I love this notion because leadership is not only about the mind. I mean, the historical notion of leadership is the visionary, the talker, the explainer, and setting direction and the rest follows, right? And in today's world, um, that, that human element needs to come in. And you describe it in this way. I always talk about leadership is mind, heart, and gut. Um, you know, you develop a growth mindset become authentic you know by accepting your vulnerability and creating that psychological safety for you and your environment um, i love your your scope um uh, metaphor uh here let's see um if there's any questions um derek already teased uh, our audience with a q a slide um but i don't see any questions coming in yet so um anybody any questions this is your time You know, as people are thinking about the questions, I want to make sure that people understand they can, if they love the acronyms, there are two books. You can go on Amazon, maybe in the available resources, Derek will put all the links and uh, would love uh, feedback from, from folks. You can follow me Why on LinkedIn. Why don't you, while we're waiting for questions, and maybe there are none because we covered so much ground, it's hard to go and maybe wrap your mind around, around all this. Um, why don't you say a bit more about your books? How do these two books differ? Um, what are, what's the content? Yeah, I, in the first one, I basically wrote it when the social justice unrest was going on because I just felt like I needed to do something. And uh, it was very clear that those in strong professions have a strong role in shaping the future. And, and we want to make sure that uh, we have diversity in STEM. So I created this book and all scholarship, uh, the scholarship so that we can get more underrepresented minority women in STEM. So the first book is basically a compilation of essays on the topics of general interest. You know, it's not about the science or the scientific projects or products or patents, uh, but it's more about mundane matters that matter, like leadership, communication, innovation, career journey, parenting, and my experiences and my perspectives as, as, as an engineer, uh, a parent science advocate, thought leader. And I cover themes of STEM advocacy, the convergence of STEM and humanities that we talked about, leading from our own rung of the ladder, which I think is a very important concept, and developing a growth context. Now, what is at the heart of my second book, Engineering Fine Print, is an attempt to go deeper into the topic of transitions, to thrive and survive amidst change, uh, reflections to provide perspective, and insights into actions we can all take. And I share what has enhanced my own learning and provided me rich context and all these easy, memorable mnemonics to incorporate insights into my own thinking. And, and, and again, I love the beauty of language and the power of words, the magic of letters. And so you'll see pithy phrases and metaphors that move me. And taking the you know book, I explore the fine print with each article. In the first book, I have points to ponder that you can think about. And in the second book, there's a fine print uh, around each one of them because, you know, the last two years have made me realize that, you know, regardless of what educational path we follow, what career we end up in, that real growth, that true leadership and self-actualization comes from getting in touch with our feelings and really dissecting them, understanding our sense of identity and its evolution because we do evolve tapping into our needs at a very innate human level, and then integrating these new learnings with our lived experiences. And that's what allows us to work through transitions, reflections, and actions. And at the end of the day, like John said, it is about what is inside all of us, but it just takes time to notice, read, and realize this fine print. So that's what I talk about in the second book. And if you're wondering, yes, fine is an acronym. It's a fine one. Feelings, <laughs> identities, needs, and experiences. Jay Shri, um, it took a little bit longer. I guess we're all in the Christmas mode already, um, or mood, or both. Um, and so, but now we do have two questions. Um, and, and so they, they actually allow you probably to reinforce some of the points that you just made. Um, so one minute on each. Uh, Nicoletta is asking, what would you recommend to a student about to enroll into a STEM degree? Uh, bring your whole self, bring your authentic context, and make sure that you are getting humanities as a subject and humanities is an experience and bringing in the human context with everything you do because that is the only thing that will make science successful with our world requires innovation innovation needs science science demands diversity and diversity warrants equity and innovation needs to produce value for those four uh, elements and pillars that i just described earlier on as well you know i knew you would be answering the question in this way by now um perfect 
Rhonda is asking, how do you get feedback from your team? How do you use it? Uh, we just uh, have uh, 360 feedback, uh, which is a great tool. Uh, some people would love to just give the anonymous feedback, but you know, in our teams, we try to do one-on-ones with each other and just get to know people. It's not uh, very formal. It's having those casual relationships because that's builds trust, and trust is the most important thing that we need. If we don't have trust, we don't have a culture that can empower people because you're feeling worried about your place, your position, your performance, and so you have to build the relationship through trust and building relationships mean just spending time, committing to spending time with others. Have the honest and open conversation respectfully um, is another way to put it. Uh, hey, we are out of time. Um, Jay Shri, thank you so very much for, um, for partnering with us on this one. I loved our pre-meetings. Um, I, I love this session as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be talking to you and I, I wanna wish you a wonderful, uh, restful and restorative season um i'm sure you deserve it after uh, the year of uh, of at least um turning 75 patterns into 76 and i'm sure a whole bunch more and uh, and savor your visits to south africa and the white house um thank you for everything you do for the world um and also uh, helping our members um and our uh and, and our employees frankly even um thank you for that thank you so much for having me Audience, if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our Insights podcast series or any other, by the way. Um, you can explore the entire catalog of podcast programming from the conference board by visiting our webcast at tcb.org slash podcast. This was John Metzler. I look forward to hear you, uh, to not hear you, <laughs> you hear me, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Well, you can always switch me off. Uh, I look forward to uh, engage with you in a next uh, podcast or anywhere else. Uh, reach out to us um, on uh, on the Conference Board website, on LinkedIn. Um, and um, and thank you for, um, for spending your time. I hope you found it valuable. Um, thank you. This has been Insights from the Conference Board.